Broadcasting from the beautiful state of Maine, welcome to another episode of the Learning from Leaders podcast, the show that focuses on identifying and developing the skills and behaviors that will inspire, empower, and compel others to follow your lead. Listen as Patrick's guests talk about the powerful leadership approaches they have identified and developed, which are vital for leading in today's challenging times. These are the same approaches that will positively impact you as a leader, too. Learning from Leaders provides the right balance of leadership research with real-world scenarios, making it easy for you to rise above your best. All right, let's start the show. Hey, everybody. I'm Patrick Verano. Thank you for joining me on another episode of Learning from Leaders. And on this episode, I'm speaking with Matt Oren, who is the managing director and co-founder of a company called Evolution. This company supports senior leaders in fast-growing companies and helps them to scale their potential with long-term sustainable success. What I think is really interesting in the conversation that you're going to hear that Matt and I had is that not only they are a coaching company, but they're also a venture capital firm. And I think it's just a great combination in many ways where, especially if you're the investor, you get to help the company, I think, deal with some of the most challenging things. And and that's how do you coach leaders to inspire others in themselves to become successful? And that's really what this episode is all about. So let's get into it. Matt, thanks for being on the podcast. I really appreciate this. I had a chance to go on your website evolution.team. And there really is a different feel to it in terms of what you're trying to do as it relates to leadership. And I was wondering if you could talk about that first in regards to your company and really what its own evolution is. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Our evolution has been around for 10 years. We started it really in 2013 with the world's then fastest growing company, which was somewhat prophetic because we've worked with one fast growing company after another And it was really founded with a kind of a humble origin in the sense that it was a lifestyle business. And my co-founder, when I was working at a place called DeVita, said, Hey, Matt, why don't you jump? I've got a really a client that's got a lot of need here. And was I had a global job and was burning out and really made the jump and was went to like a lot less of a work that was also much more leveraged in terms of the influence that we had. But the early days was really exploration and building a platform that supported organizations with coaching, 360s, leadership development, management training, and culture. And we, for a year and a half, were able to experiment essentially with this one client and build our platform that still is pretty much the same as it is today. And developing the whole organization really via leadership development and coaching, they got acquired and we had the real decision to make around what do we want to do here? Because this lifestyle business could persist as it is, but we got a bunch of clients in the door in early 2015 that really forced us to answer the question of whether or not we actually wanted to build a firm. And we did. We said, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it differently. And we're going to make it a dual-sided platform. So our clients are on one side. And then on the other side, it's a place where coaches could come and have a full-time home as partners, but in a kind of an unusual way and designing it in a way that they still can maintain autonomy and independence. And that has created this like incredibly fertile ecosystem where it's a pretty flat organization. It self-manages relatively well. But it's just grown like a weed, or maybe like there's a more positive framing for that. But as an ecosystem, it's all people to like build their own books of business and experiment and follow passion projects, all working with a consistent set of values, which we have. To today, Evolution's got 150 clients and partners all over the world. And we are a fully functioning executive coaching firm, including operations staff, about 60 people. And so our biggest clients currently, clients like Slack, Glassdoor, Radiology Partners, Twitter, actually. And we are working in mostly growth stage companies. So in the venture world, kind of B and C run companies. But we also work with very early stage companies and have our own investment arm, venture capital, as well as late stage companies that I mentioned previously. We love our work. We partner with people long term. And our model really follows integral theory, which says, if you're going to develop a human or an organization, you have to look at three dimensions. And this is our logo, the I, the we, and the it. The it is the technical and the impersonal. It's the product, the system, the process. The we is the relational, which is the relationship, the trust, the team dynamic, the culture. And then the I, of course, is the individual's EQ, their self-awareness, and then also objective things like how they use their time and their priorities. And any issue you can really cut from those three levels. And that kind of holistic approach is really 
what is it a differentiator is at the center of evolution and how we really think about constructing our work with our clients who we love and again partner with long term we tend to really optimize the long term not the short term and be really long term strategic partners and many of our clients we have building badges and are very close to being almost employees it's just how we believe in the nature of the work that we're very passionate about it and it tends to be all of our life's work and watching a leader develop or an organization achieve its potential is like an incredibly fulfilling thing. And for most of us wearing our heart on our sleeves, we think that business is the leverage point for change in the world. So that's why we're doing what we're doing. You mentioned values. We hear a lot about that, right? And you say that your business has been driven by its values. What what are those? Yeah. So our values, which were chosen by the people in the organization, we had a bunch of focus groups and we talked about them and kind of hemmed and hawed and then boiled them down are very special to us. And we give awards on them once a year, a value awards, people that represent the best of our values. And they are wonder, equity, authenticity, community, growth, and wisdom. And those all represent different aspects of like who we are as a tribe. So wonder, that one stands out to me. Yeah, that one's my favorite. If you look at the title, if you look at the first slide on our culture guide, we built one like people do. The quote that is unattributable that they say maybe Socrates is, wonder is the beginning of wisdom. And in our values, wonder is the first one and wisdom is the last one. And the sense of wonder is that like life is an adventure. We seek moments of awe. Spirituality is a part of who we are. We wear that on our sleeve. We orient ourselves with nature's pace. Sometimes we're slow. Sometimes we're fast. Seeking to find a sense of flow really is a guide for our experience. And we cultivate these things like simplicity, humility, and gratitude, and just a sense of openness. And evolution has been built out of wonder. It's like, wow, what if we did that? Or like, wow, what if we designed a retreat in Maui that helped people do the deepest work of their lives? Or what if we designed a firm actually, but broke apart all the normal constraints of a business, including like what the nature of the organizational structure is. And so that kind of adventure and exploration is to use a big word, phenomenological. It's not like here's the deductive goal that we want to hit and like draw a line to it. We're just kind of like, Hey, let's go surf that wave or let's go climb that mountain. And here we are 10 years later with a pretty sizable business that has really been driven by kind of exploration and adventure. So I'm wondering, I call it BC before COVID and now after COVID, your thoughts in terms of the work that you do around people wanting to find themselves and this wonder, (laughs) has it picked up for you? Yeah, it has. It was surprising. I think everybody was in our line of work was really scared and kind of the books all closed that first couple of months of COVID. But then Everybody I'm talking to had the biggest year of their lives in 2021. Yeah. I mean, it was massive. And some of it, I joke kind of cynically, people were just stuck in their house, in their office, their house office, their closet, their garage. <laughs> Kitchen where, table. Yeah. It's like, what else are you going to do other than reflect and do a little personal <laughs> growth? At the very least, it's a distraction. And so there's that. And also just because it's like, what did we have? So it's like, here we are. People are like highly dysregulated, stressed out and anxious those are the times we need to double down on personal development and like use it as a big collective reflection. Now we did. What that is actually going to net out is a whole nother conversation that I'm somewhat cynical about. But I do think it was a time of global reflection for all the reasons. And also because like the economy was doing really well, people really invested a lot in it. And I think if you track the macro trend of people doing personal development, I kind of joke Eckhart Tolle beyond. Oprah's pod show in the mid 2000s, like the wave is breaking around personal development in the culture, right? People are meditating now. Yoga 20 years ago was a fringe activity. It's not. So I think like the pandemic accelerated that even further, where it's just a part of people's lives. So I will see right now with the economy what happens. If anything, I think now is a little bit more of a challenging time and then what was there. But I definitely think like our line of work is kind of optimized for times of liminality and stress. And it's when you need to invest. Without question. A couple of things as I was going through your website and noticed one of the words or phrases that you used was life presence, work with individuals on life presence. What is that? 
Yeah, presence is the total quality of how you show up. It's like how present you are, ability to be kind of in the moment. It's your body language. It's your affect. It's the energy that you exude, a sense of calmness, centeredness, and power. And helping people find that sense of calmness, centeredness, and power is not an outside-in journey. I mean, you can certainly have people stand up and put their shoulders back and But really what happens is when you really exude that, a couple of things. One, we call it life presence because the life work line just evaporates. And it's like, if you develop presence, you're going to develop it all over. It's ontological. Your way of being follows you wherever you go. So you're going to show up as a parent. You're going to show up as a leader. You're going to show up as a coach, a friend. So we don't make any bones about like, or any excuses. It's like, yep, we're going to develop your presence. The context we're in is you as a leader. But this stuff is human skills because organizations are just a bunch of humans. And so we optimize the human system the same way. And so we don't really care about that line. And the the way we do it is by the inside out approach, not outside in. I mean, I definitely think it's important to like figure out like what you're projecting and shift yourself and your body and how you speak and everything. But once people find out who they are and answer those big questions, who am I and where am I going and with whom and what are the parts of me that lie in shadow and what needs integration and what do I need to heal? What are the blind spots that I have? And as people go on that journey, they become more whole and integrated as a person. And I think like when we pattern like, wow, that person is powerful, it's because they've found themselves. They're, they've found their wholeness. They found their integration. They've gone on their hero's journey. And what the result of that is presence. They're just, they've got that gravitas and that power that just like comes out of their cells and you can't fake it or white knuckle it. Adversity basically breeds it. And the last piece with that is you go through your hero's journey and you go through adversity. A core part of the hero's journey is the sage who helps the person going through the journey, not just like, like completely combust. You actually need somebody there holding up the mirror helping you integrate as you go through these trials. And if you do that, you end up more whole. You've got to get support, which is, of course, the thesis for coaching or therapy or whatever. And as you do that, you really find out who you are in a really, really powerful way. And so presence, the greatest leaders that people vibrate and follow to the ends are the people that have the deepest presence is our belief. So... Yeah, you mentioned the mirror. I think it's the most important leadership tool we have a lot of the times is to be able to look at that. It's the simplest, but the most powerful to yeah to be able to reflect yeah. on who we are. It is. I mean, what is it? Life is not about the way we want it to be. It's the way it is. And what we choose is what makes the difference. Kind of bastardizing the Virginia Satir quote. It's like looking at yourself with absolute sobriety and scrubbing the lens all of the parts, including the ones that are less nice to look at and being open sometimes to the fact that you need to be mirrored back to, you can't do it yourself. Feedback and you need coaching is really what creates it. And leadership is such a social psychology. It's a human element. I mean, what we're talking about is like how you bring people along with you towards a common end. And leadership is perception. It doesn't matter. Perception is reality and leadership. And so if you can't see yourself and you can't see the perceptions of yourself, regardless, it doesn't matter who you think you are. Leadership is in the eyes of the lead. And so if you don't have some mirroring function and we can talk about what those are, I really think you're falling down. Challenge though, I think for leaders is that there are limited people that can actually hold the mirror up to them in their own company. And that's where I think coaching or outside individuals, the sage is important because I think leading at the top can be a lonely place to be for individuals to get real feedback. Yep. It can. I mean, this is why when we engage in with someone and we do coaching, 90% of the time we do a 360. The 360 review, I assume this has probably been on your podcast where you interview basically there's different styles, including a test version, a survey version, which we, we have as well. We'll interview 12 people people that report to them, people that are their peers, people that are their boss, or if they don't have a boss, there's a CEO of the board. We also include their spouse, by the way, sometimes, or people from their life. And you get a holistic picture of this person's strengths and opportunities. And almost 
always there's an input that highlights some aspect of their blind spot. And so that is a way where it's hard to gain leverage and people aren't really motivated to change unless they have their blind spots highlighted. And especially if you're a very senior leader or a CEO, there aren't many people that tell you the truth. And I like creating, helping teams create a culture where everybody's telling each other the truth as much as possible, compassionately, but honestly. And then you've got to have those people, including a coach, but also people inside of the organization and out who can give it to you straight. And man, is that valuable. I have a cluster of people around me that I also count on that for major life decisions or what's happening. And it's invaluable. So, Which leads into, I think, a term that we hear more often now around psychological safety within organizations. But I find it interesting because the research on psychological safety has been around since the 60s and 70s, become more popularized now. Yeah. I mean, I'll take a bit of an iconoclastic view on that. I certainly believe in psychological safety and think like, I agree with the research, right? People perform best when they feel psychologically safe to take risks, to be themselves, to speak up, to have put out ideas, to have safe levels of conflicts, right? That create dynamic tension in decision-making. Stress also creates performance, right? Like low levels of stress are is good. And I think part of what's happened is we've over-optimized in psychological safety and it's all about, hey, let's just be nice and kind of worship the altar of feelings and yeah. safe. And meanwhile, like, let's talk about like, how can you be safe, but also kind of on your edge and like leaning into something that maybe as an experience pushes you to the boundaries of like what your comfort zone is and what your safety is. And I don't know that there's a completely scientific way to do that. There's like an artful tension between in that. And so I take the view that psychological safety is really important to curate and you can't just like push people without it. And your goal as a leader is to create an impact. And this is the difference between leadership and just personal development. Like your goal is like you're driving towards something. And so sometimes that makes means things are going to have to be a little uncomfortable and you're going to probably not optimize for psychological safety. My thought would be on that is that you stress is certainly that positive kind of stress that you're talking about it. But if we've developed a set of behaviors with a team, we've earned the right and I think an obligation to challenge each other in a way that is safe. Might not be comfortable, but it's safe. Yeah, well said. I mean, I'm a big fan of the emotional bank account, right? It's like, if I know somebody actually cares about me, actually cares about me, and they spent time getting to know me and all the positive deposits, then yeah, they can say stuff to me that's like pretty direct. That would be, quote, unsafe. Yeah. If we didn't have that depth of relationship. And the other thing to contradict myself, which I love doing, is finding that flow state where like the challenge meets the the level of ability where the team just starts to hum together. It's fun. There's a lot of laughter. You don't have to insert artificial angst or conflict because they're just rocking. And we've all been on those teams before. So I think it's a little dangerous also to say like, hey, I'm going to just be a challenger here. And people that like, basically a leader should be trying to find the flow state for their team, not trying to agitate them towards action, which is, I think like when you see people like some of these people like Elon Musk or Jobs, it's like, I actually think like their gifts to society are going to be substantial. I would say they're still not great leaders. And I think you can be Elon Musk and not a great leader. And he's in the 1% of 1% of 1%. Everybody else needs to focus on creating a flow state for the team. And like, it's like Ted Lasso, right? It's like, you watch what Ted Lasso did to that team. And then it's like fun and energetic. And of course it's safe. And you don't have to be a jerk. And you can lean into each other. And it's kind of like the rough and tumble of being on a sports team. It's not scary conflict. So anyway. It is funny when you hear people talk about that. Well, look at jobs or somebody like that. Well, that's, you don't have the iPhone. You're the rest right. of us that need to right. figure out. You better figure out how to get people to want to go where you're asking them to yeah. go. Right. I know. And I think, yeah, there's always those people, Henry Ford and stuff. And like, I think it isn't a model to build towards. I think like if you're a genius and you're developing a product that's going to change the world, like that's your gift. And I think a lot of times behind a lot of those people are operations folks and whatnot that are ostensibly leading the people right? Meanwhile, you've got a product focused CEO that's out there designing the thing. And like, that's cool too. You can't assume that there isn't any leaders in those organizations because there absolutely are. So anyway. When you talk about scaling 
without losing your soul, I think of purpose, where we're really meant to go. And I'm wondering, along the same lines of before COVID, now, do you see more individuals really saying, what am I meant to do? And how do you help people get there? Really, let me address that first, and then I'll talk about the origins of that term, because it really is about an organization as it scales can lose its soul, like scale is the enemy in some ways, which is again, somewhat countercultural. I think the culture broke over the last few years, like everything that we knew broke. Like I remember when they like were canceling like the baseball season. And I was like, what? Like all of these things that you just kind of assume is our mutable pillars, right? All of a sudden it's gone. And like, so it rocked the foundations of who we are as a culture. And then I think with that, you see things like the great resignation and the quiet quitting and I want to work quarter time. And people are starting to relate to work, to purpose. And they're starting to ask each other more the bigger questions about who they are and what they actually want to do. Because the way we were working was so unconscious. And it was like kind of like we were all, all on autopilot. I still don't know how much better it's gotten. I feel like we're still, by the way, in the middle of that transition. So we won't know what we have for another 10 years. But like the way we were living needed to fundamentally break. And all those people, I mean, you probably too, like early pandemic, it was like the worst thing in the world. And then you remember like at the end of it, everybody was like, man, I don't want to get back to it. I like spending time with the people in my house. And I don't really want to go have awkward conversations with people. And I like my place. And I'm a little bit more of an introvert than I thought I was. And I didn't even realize how much in burnout I was with all that dumb travel, the two hour meeting in Dallas that everybody flies to. And so it like, there was an awakening around like what life really was and what's important, I think, in a lot of people. And so, yeah, they're asking questions about what work is and what kind of work do I want to do and what kind of job, how do I want to design my work life in ways that nobody did before the pandemic? Almost to the point where organizations that said, no, you can't work remotely. And then all of a sudden they were forced into it. It's like, well, I guess we can do that. So now people are saying, right. okay. I'm not right. You back. remember when Marissa Mayer did that in like 2013? She was like, here we are, major tech company, you know, who, by the way, back then, everybody was still doing that in ways people could work from home and stuff. And she said, people could work from home. And it was just an absolute disaster of leadership, right? In that way. And there's no way we're going to ever go back to those worlds. I mean, people are start self selecting kind of what organization they want, fully remote, not hybrid which is cool. Anyway, this fascinating conversation into itself, everybody's having real time. Like our belief in terms of scaling without losing your soul is that like when you start a business, like there's a, it's almost like they have like a soul, like an identity is born, right? Larry Ackerman wrote a book called Identity is Destiny. He talks about this from kind of a branding angle. And we think of the term essence as a, the core, the soul of a business. And like internally, it's felt like culture. Externally, it's felt like brand. They're two sides of the same whole. And it's pure when early on, it's kind of like evolution's values when we went through this last thing a year and a half ago. I mean, I say this without any kind of judgment, but they were the same values and we didn't influence it that my co-founder and I thought of 10 years ago. And so that is a positive trait because it proves that the social construction of an organization are like has a life. And what happens as you go through scale is you bring in HR people who go on autopilot and just pull stuff off the shelf. You hire people just for technical ability. You don't really have a hiring rubric that filters, are they a good culture fit? You don't have any mechanisms like management training, not just management training, but culturally relevant management training of like, what does management look like here? And those are mechanisms that like Jeff Bezos was one of the first people that talked about that. Those mechanisms reinforce the essence of the organization as it grows And the most iconic companies that end up as alumni farms, and I worked at one. I mean, you look at David as arguably one of the top healthcare alumni farms that exist out there. And Baxter or Google, they spent an inordinate amount of time and obsession around internal communications, culture building, personal leadership development, right? I mean, the last thing I did at David was designing a meditation retreat with Tija Bell, a Qigong guy, ex-Bain people and Harvard MBAs were going through a four-day thing. Right. I mean, like what kind of public healthcare company invests in that kind of stuff? But it was part of their belief connecting to the value of fulfillment around Davida being a place where people grow as humans, a pillar of their culture. So they built all these mechanisms that reinforce that as they scale. And so we love going on that journey with our clients and saying, like, if you can do it, but it takes a lot of investment and intentionality. And if you want to be an iconic company that's an alumni farm that leaves a dent beyond just the thing that you do, 
you've got to care about retaining your essence as you go through these gauntlets of scale. I love that you mentioned that in terms of the intentionality part of it. I always ask, what are your values? What's your mission? It's a compass for us that we can ask ourselves, so the decision we're making right now, is it in alignment with what we say we stand as exactly. an organization? Our yeah. behaviors, how are we treating people? Are they in alignment with what we say we stand for as an organization? Yeah. I think we miss an opportunity there. Yeah, we have a slide that shows all the ways of reinforcing culture. It's like a bloom and it's like internal comms, meetings, in the way the brand internally, office space, manager behaviors, education and training. And you can design a product roadmap, a culture roadmap based on that, right? Like long term, keep ticking stuff off gradually. And you've got this beautiful then system of culture reinforcers. But the top one at the top, and it's at the top intentionally, is leader behaviors. All that stuff is moot if leaders don't show up in a way that's in alignment. And it's always a red flag when we get brought in to like do some leadership development thing. And it's like everybody's doing it but the C-suite. It's like they need to go first and like role model it and reinforce it. It's good for you. We're all set. We don't need it. You all need right. it. Right, yeah, so right. Good right. luck with that. Yeah. Yeah, I always love it, especially with the basics and like some feedback training. They're like, oh, no, we're good at that. And then we're hearing like all the stories of the way that's just like, true. yeah. I mean, it's also, it's humbling in the sense that like Kenneth DeVita was like a lifelong student and tracked his 360 feedback over 10 years. And I remember him doing town halls and he was like, I used to leave these really intense voicemail messages and I started to muscle build to just like, I would like hit delete and I'd leave it again and I'd hit delete. And he's like, I just got better and better. And he's like, over the course of 10 years, I saw myself gradually get better. And so that's the kind of intentionality that it takes. And he's a, he tracks, he's a huge metric person. He tracked every single metric about everything to actually get better. But to assume, even though that you're a senior leader, that you're good at that stuff, it's a mess. I mean, it's perennial human stuff, right? And so... To me, this is like going to the gym. If right. you stop going to the gym, don't be surprised when you lose muscle and leadership exactly. is, right. is no different, right? We're always trying to grow. And it's a Once, human skill, right? It's like, it's yeah. not... I mean, if you want to get better at leadership, you have to learn about humans, most importantly, yourself and like, you know, yourself first. And so... You can spend all your time in the PL and looking at OKRs and management processes and getting into market analyses and TAM and all these things. And but at the end of the day, especially if you're leading leaders, and if you're leading leaders who lead leaders, you're thinking of multiple levels beneath you. At that point, it is the human element 100 percent And because of all our defense mechanisms, people don't tend to actively spend a lot of time there unless they're highly unusual. So they need somebody nudging them into that conversation. Yeah. Because people don't give a shit how smart you are, like you don't care about them. Exactly. One thing that I was thinking about as you were talking about people not wanting to go back to the old environment. I was in Denver yesterday doing a workshop. This was the first time this group got back together over two years. And one of the individuals said, I didn't know how much I disliked Mm -hmm. the commute in here until I did it. And he said, I don't want to do that again. Yeah, I know. It's just, it's, there's a part of it that like stole our humanity away. And I just think like now, we have the opportunity. The other thing that happened, I don't know if you track this too, was early on, it was like, gosh, I can't be on another Zoom, right? It just yeah. sucks my soul. And now it's the opposite. I'm like, ugh, I have to go in for a live meeting. Why can't we do a Zoom? <laughs> I don't mind it at all. My men's group had to be live. And now and then it transitioned, of course, to Zoom over the pandemic. Now we meet over Zoom and it's fine. You stay in your house. There's a level of humanity. It's awesome. By the way, David is in Denver. Do you live in Colorado? No, I'm in Maine. So I took a red eye back last night. Still feeling the pain from it. Yeah. Oh, man, those are rough. Anyway, yeah. So what do you think is the biggest challenge for leaders in this environment going forward? We're looking at potentially a shift in our economy. How does that play into this? Well, I think there's two questions there. And I think the second one is its own question, which is like, given the economic conditions that everybody's feeling like, how do you lead in that? It's the first time. What has it been? A 10-year bull run? I mean, especially in the venture world, it's just like, this is the first time any of them have felt a kind of downturn in this way. So why don't I hit that one first? Because it's more maybe tactical, a little, the other one's like more, a little bit more complex, but I think a really important question for, to, for people to wrestle with. One of the biggest mistakes I'm seeing are people that want to just like cut 20% because they're freaked out and they want to extend their runway or their boards pressuring them or whatever. And 
they're doing it in kind of a thoughtless way. Sometimes it's like, well, here's where we're going next year. But like, if you are on a growth path and you raised a big round and you've got money in the bank, you may need to, and you're not in any existential danger of the doors like shutting, then like stay the course, right? And like invest and keep people positive. And like, I think one of the best things a CEO can do, especially a CEO, is you've got to take the long view because everybody else is thinking short term. In the long view, all will be well. And if you can orient people to that, they calm down and they can just see this as a white water part of the journey. And then we're going to be in smooth waters. And if you can like, when people get into fear, we know this in neuroscience, like (laughs) our prefrontal cortex shuts down. There's less options. It's not a great place to make judicious decision-making. This sounds really self-serving, but like, don't cut coaching. Don't cut the development program. It keeps people alive, right? Like I realize like that social media person you might not want, but you know what? It's great to have them engaging in the world that way. And I think like the pressure from the CFO or the board or whatever to just like ruthlessly cut costs is a fear-based response. Economics is still a behavioral science. And so how can you not make fear-based decisions knowing that, yes, we have to be sober and that economic conditions, there's a contraction happening. So no, we're not going to be frivolous, but let's... So many people are making knee-jerk fear-based decisions and I think harming themselves long-term because of that. Without question. I often think of the smoke detector in our houses, right? When we burn food on the stove and that goes off, we don't run into the street calling 911 because we know it's not a real emergency, but our amygdala does the exact same thing in our brains right now. It signals us, emergency, get out when it's not. It's not a real emergency. (laughs) It's, yeah, I mean, it's really, we're able to, and that's the thing about like, it's like being a parent, right? Like, yeah, you might have a tough month, but you still don't tell your kids, Hey, guess what? We're right on edge. I don't know if we're going to be able to like put food in the table, but that stuff doesn't do any good to the kids. It's not their responsibility. It's yours as the leader. And so that's where it's like, get your coach, process your fear, make sense of the decision and make the most integrity based, enterprise based, long term human based decision you can knowing that, yes, it's not the gold rush years, but you still need to, if you're incumbent upon you to make the best decision and not just the one you know that everybody's getting. And just as an aside, one of the, this is kind of a funny thing, one of our clients, they're in a Slack with a bunch of other venture back companies and they major the AAA Sand Hill Road venture people. They literally all got the same almost form letter in late May saying cut 20%. I mean, like the pressure you get from a board and like, I might lose some venture capital friends. At that time, it was just this like broad stroke thing, cut and prepare yourself, batten down the hatches. And it's like, some of that is okay, but like not every business is different. If you're in healthcare, like that's a perennial. It's like, so you really have to really understand your market, your people, your short-term trajectory, your long-term trajectory and really be like King Solomon and use a, have a real sense of discretion around your decision-making, not just do the knee-jerk thing and especially responding in a fear-based way to pressure from the board or stuff you're hearing in the market that is all just noise anyway. And we all don't know what's going to happen exactly. So keep your wits about you and keep breathing and do your yoga and talk to your coach. Okay. The other one though, I think is the bigger question, which is your question around like, what does a leader need to do now, which includes what I just said? And this is where like, I mean, I'm kind of interested in your perspective, but I think it's leadership now is so much more complex than it was however many years ago. I mean, we're living in a VUCA environment, right? It's volatile. It's rapidly changing. It's chaotic. The culture wars exist in businesses now where you have to do that. There is a budding belief that businesses are need to have a relationship with their stakeholders, including the planet including communities, including people of color. There's a recognition that businesses can actually do harm if they're just like ruthlessly capitalist and don't include any other things. There's also a massive change in social mores, how people digest and how you reach people from a marketing standpoint. There's a massive change in the nature of technology and how it's impacting businesses, not to mention a generation that's been weaned on emotional intelligence and personal growth. And the ability for people to lead interesting lives, not having a job for 50 years, but having many jobs or three jobs at a time. I could just keep going on. So what the hell are you supposed to do as a leader, including all that? It's like so complex. And I think like you need to have quiet space to be able to sort yourself out and you need to be a learner and you need to 
take input, knowing that this isn't General Mills in 1958, right, where it was kind of pulling a lever, an assembly line, and the thing moved. You're, there's a complexity in a chaotic environment that really requires the thesis is personal development, is mindfulness, is groundedness that allows you to have the discretion to knife through the noise. So along those lines, I certainly would agree that it's become much more complex, but I also believe that we have overcomplicated leadership in that there are timeless behaviors that if we fall back and use those as a foundation, a lot of these other things that are going on, I believe are almost self-correct. In the self, what I love about this conversation and where your work is that you're focusing so much on the person, the internal person. And I think that's the part that has been missing for so long in terms of this is not about delegation or looking at reports as much as it is, who am I? What am I about? From a human standpoint, how do I connect with those people around me in a way that they feel like I care about them? I really care about them, not just they're a means to an end for where I need to go. Yeah, I think I love that. I think it's really well said. And, you know, there's this principle in like chaos theory, is it right? Or the kind of the you think about physics, it's like, the universe is governed by some very simple principles. It's a lot of chaos and simple, simple principles and people being people. Purposefulness, kindness, integrity, clarity, like these things empathy. are empathy. Yeah, it's perennial. And so I think you're right. I think the thing to do, right, which is like, is to find that quiet space inside of you where you find out who you are and what you really believe in and the core tenets of humanity and your humanity. And like that allows in what you said, which I really agree with the noise to just be the noise. And it kind of that it knifes through it. I also think simple things sometimes are the most difficult. And it's so easy to get thrown by all that stuff, we can kind of lose track from the simple truth that's set in front of us in a moment to moment. So yeah, it's really well said and wholeheartedly agree. I mean, definitely. Thanks for this conversation. I really have appreciated this, Matt. If people want to get a hold of you to find out more about how they can get involved in, and maybe they want to go to Maui, I certainly would love to go out to Hawaii right yeah. now. How do they do that? Yeah, evolution.team. So www.evolution.team is our website. We've got in a newsletter called Essentials where we curate specific content that goes out once a month, sometimes twice a month. We have a podcast you can find on Spotify, also on our website. And I'm at Matt Oren at Twitter. You can find me there. You can find me on LinkedIn or any other places. I'm happy to talk to folks. And yeah, I really appreciate the conversation and all the work you're doing as well, Patrick. And this is, these conversations are really timely given what's happening as we spoke about in the world. Well, thanks again. I'm wishing you all the best. All right. You too. Take care. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to my podcast. If you found the guests and topics on my show and my perspectives on the show to be valuable to your own personal growth or to the growth of your team, I would love the opportunity to have a discussion with you on how the models, the approaches, and the book that I've published, The Leadership Bridge, How to Engage Your Employees and Drive Organizational Excellence, can help you and your organization as well. If you're interested, you can reach out to me at Patrick at emeryleadershipgroup.com, and that's E-M-E-R-Y, leadershipgroup.com. And let's explore how my unique models and approaches can help you and your team or your organization to rise above your best. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Learning from Leaders podcast. If you've enjoyed the show, please feel free to rate, review, and subscribe on your preferred podcast listening platform. We really appreciate that effort. Until next time, keep rising above your best as a leader.